can only imagine what it would be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes would see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever Forever worship you, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Oh, oh, oh. To be surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you, keep still? Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or oh, in all you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever Forever worship can only imagine Good morning and welcome to Cummings Street Baptist Church located right here in the heart of Memphis, Tennessee. I am Pastor Eddie Jones and as always, it is an honor to be here with you one more time. Speaking of honor, as many of you know, February is recognized as Black History Month. And so I would like to take this month to honor a few of my favorite African-American authors. After all, it is a book, the good book that is, the Bible, that guides and directs every aspect of our lives. And everything that we do here at Common Street is centered around the Bible. So every Sunday this month, we're going to take a look at an African-American author, an individual who has paved the way for each of us through their life, through their legacy, and through their literature. Today's sermon title is borrowed from a novel that was written by Ralph Ellison entitled Invisible Man. As some of you may know, Ralph Ellison was the first African-American author to win the National Book Award for nonfiction. And his book 
was also the first novel written by an African American that spoke to my own personal experiences and ignited a passion in me that would later lead me to write and publish three books of my own. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, starting with verse 13, reads, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15 says, but what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. For this was not revealed to you. For this was not visible to you until God made it possible for you to see. For our time together this morning, I'd like to tag today's sermon, The Invisible Man. <laughs> the Invisible Man. In, in 1952, Ralph Ellison, who was frustrated with the way that he was being treated because of the color of his skin, he decided to channel his frustrations into a published book entitled the Invisible Man. Here it is, Invisible Man. It's the story of a young, college-educated black man who struggles to survive and succeed in a racially divided world uh, that's refusing to see him as a human being. The setting of the novel is during the pre-civil rights era when segregation laws prevented black folks from enjoying the same basic human rights as their white counterparts. And the narrator of the book opens up in that first chapter uh, with, with one of the strongest phrases in the entire book. He says, I am an invisible man. Hmm. The narrator says he's not physically invisible, but is invisible because others refuse to see him. The narrator opens up the novel with an event that he recalls from his childhood when he was invited by a white school superintendent to give a speech at a local hotel in front of the most prominent white men in town. But when he arrives at the hotel, he's forced to participate blindfolded in a boxing match with nine of his classmates. It was part of the evening's entertainment. And following the boxing match, the townspeople made the boys scramble around on this floor, scrambling around for gold coins only to discover the coins were worthless brass tokens. The young narrator, now bruised and bleeding, is finally allowed to give his speech in front of the drunken white man who were just ignoring him because he really was just entertainment for them. They ignored him until he accidentally used the phrase social equality instead of social responsibility to describe the role of blacks in America. And at the end of the speech, the narrator is given a briefcase containing what he was told was a scholarship to the State College for Negroes. But when he opens the briefcase, he finds a note that reads, keep this nigger boy running. Now I won't spoil the rest of the story for those who plan to borrow the book from the library or order a copy online to read this month, but the opening of this novel sets the stage for the rest of the story. And I, I wanted to use this because invisibility is one of the main reasons why we have Black History Month. It's to remind us all that we are people with a real history, a people with substance, with gifts and contributions who deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the reality of it is, is that many people are invisible to us because they live in a world that's different, different set of circumstances, some of them live right in our neighborhood. Some we pass by on a cold morning in our heated cars while we sit, while we sit looking at them. They're sitting on the side of the road waiting for somebody to show mercy. Some don't walk like us, don't talk like us, don't live like we live. Some of them work in the same office every day with us, yet they are invisible to us because we never really see their world. We don't know their story because to us, they are invisible not important, of no value. 
We make folks invisible when we choose not to respond to their hurt. When we choose not to respond to their situation, we make folks invisible when we don't regard them as equally deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When we don't think that people count or matter, we rob them of their basic human rights. Watch the text with me this morning because I really want us to focus in on the text. Jesus needed to reveal two things to his disciples. If they missed these two things, the world would miss them too. His disciples, you know, the guys that hung with him, his disciples couldn't make other disciples until they understood two things. Number one, who Jesus is. And number two, what he came to do. That's it. That's it. I know you were waiting for a complicated algebraic equation or some scholarly dissertation, but it's just that simple. Disciples needed to see who Jesus was and know what he came to do. Jesus is with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. They've stolen away some time from the crowds in Galilee. And Jesus, knowing what his disciples were going to encounter as they spread the gospel, he starts probing their minds with a simple question. He says to them, who do men say that I am? And one by one, the Bible notes, they started chiming in with the responses. <laughs> one of them says, some say that you're John the Baptist. And another said, folks swear that you prophet, that you're the prophet Elijah. Another one said, the people are saying that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But obviously he couldn't be John the Baptist because Jesus and John ministered at the same time. He preached repentance and forgiveness of sins just like John did, but he wasn't John the Baptist. He wasn't the ghost of Elijah or Jeremiah either. He performed miracles just like Elijah, but he wasn't Elijah. Jesus cared for sinners and wept for the hardened hearts of God's people, but he wasn't Jeremiah. Clearly, it was evident that folks had underestimated who Jesus was. He was performing miracle after miracle, teaching multitudes, but who Jesus was and what he came to do was invisible to them. When that question didn't give him the response that he was looking for, Jesus asked another question, and this time he got a little bit more personal. Verse 15, Jesus says, but what about you? Can you imagine he's sitting around with all his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? In other words, I know what you've heard about me. I know what folks in town are saying about me. I know you've heard what the world thinks about me, but who do you say that I am? It was no longer about what folks had to say, but now who would the men walking with Jesus say that he is? Could it be that they too had missed him? Could it be that Jesus was invisible to even those who were closest to him? The disciples should know the answer to this question, right? They've touched Jesus, they've been with Jesus, but the boys are silent until Peter, the overzealous disciple, <laughs> you know, ear slicing Peter, the spontaneous spokesperson Peter, he breaks out, breaks the silence, boldly announces, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. It was Peter who answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Peter's answer was greater than a compliment. No, 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 Jesus. You're more than a good teacher. You're greater than just a prophet. You're more than a miracle worker. All these things are true about you but you're more than all of these put together. You're God's son. These are the words out of Peter's mouth. And just like that, Jesus was no longer invisible. Can we talk? You do know that you have to answer this same question for yourself. Who do you say Jesus is? Who would the deacons at Common Street say Jesus is? Who would the pastor, the preacher say that Jesus is? Your walk depends on how you answer this. How you live is determined by how you answer this. The way you choose to love all hangs on answering this one question correctly. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he just another great teacher? Is he one of the host, uh, the, the prophets from old sent by God? Is he some reincarnation of a leader from our past? Or like Peter exclaimed, is Jesus the son of God 
come to save the whole of humanity. How you answer this question will determine heaven or hell. I know, I, I know, I know you got a lot of questions facing you every day. Every day, Lord knows we got questions like, what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? When will this pandemic be over? What's God's purpose for my life? Is this person right for me or are they wrong for me? Which bill can I pay? Which bill can I afford to pay this week? All, all kinds of questions. I know you got a lot of questions facing you every day, but this question is the most important because it affects your now and your later. <laughs> this, this question demands a right now response with later on type of results because Jesus can't become real or visible until you see Jesus for yourself. You can't go to heaven on mama and them's faith. <laughs> you gotta get your own set of spiritual frames so that you can see Jesus for yourself like the commercial, no, my brother, you got you got to get your own. <laughs> who, who do you say Jesus is? It's important that Jesus be visible to his disciples, because if they're disciples, if we are followers, if we can't see him for who he really is, then how will the rest of the world see Jesus? The Bible says that God revealed he took the covers off so that Jesus could become visible to Peter. Hold up, hold up, Pastor. Stop, rewind, play that again, Pastor. What, what you, God revealed, God pulled the covers off? What are you saying? In other words, Peter couldn't see with his natural eyes who Jesus was. He was like the others, too caught up in the miracles, too caught up in the teaching, too caught up in the crowds that he missed Jesus. But when God revealed, when God pulled the covers off and took the covers off to reveal who Jesus was, Jesus became visible. And maybe that's what God is attempting to do in this pandemic. Maybe he's attempting to reveal some things in us, reveal some people to us, reveal his son to us. Maybe, 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 maybe we're blinded by the church building, <laughs> by the preacher, by what the choir is singing, by the fellowship after church. Maybe we're too blinded and focused on those things that we missed who Jesus is and what he came to do. If you don't have a personal relationship with him, then Jesus is not visible to you. And I don't want you to miss him this morning. Jesus. His name is Jesus. He's the son of God. He was despised by men, rejected by his own. But he said, if I be lifted up for all men to see, I'll draw all men unto me. His name is Jesus. He's the son of God. He bore our sins on the cross at Calvary, buried, uh, was buried in a borrowed tomb, but three days later rose with the power to save, sanctify, and set free. His name is Jesus. He's the son of God. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. His name, his name is Jesus. He's the son of God. He's here. He's ready to be visible in your life. All you need to do is open up your heart and receive him on today. Make him visible in your life. And those of you who agree with the preached word of God this morning, shout glory to God. Amen. Amen. Listen, my friend, is Christ visible to you? Brother, have you met Jesus? My sister, do you have a relationship with the one who gave his life for you? Well, this morning will be a great time for you to get to know Jesus. Simply confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead for your soul salvation and for your saving on today. I pray that God becomes visible in your spirit and that he comes in to dwell and commune in your heart today. Amen. Look, speaking of communion with God, it's communion time at the street. So please go ahead and have someone in your household to serve the elements that you've prepared 
as I go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we, uh, we bless you, God, for this time of communion. We pray that you will bless our hearts and forgive us, God, of any sins that we've committed against you, God. We pray that you will uh, allow the righteousness of Christ to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we repent of our wrongdoings and we pray that you will have mercy upon us, that you will allow grace to fall upon us, and that you will clean us up and make us new. We thank you for this time of communion. We look forward to the, to the, the return of your son. And in the meantime, God, we give you the glory for the opportunity to worship you. In the name of Christ Jesus, we do thank you. Amen. Amen. Listen, another conversation was taking place on the night before Jesus went to the cross at Calvary. With his disciples sitting around the table, Jesus takes the bread and he blesses it. He blesses it and he breaks it and he serves it to his disciples. And he says, this is my body given as a sacrifice for your sins. Take ye and eat. And then, holding up the cup, he proclaims that in this cup is the blood of the New Testament. It will be poured out for the remission of man's sins. So take it and drink of it. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Listen, what an awesome time we've had this morning. Praise, prayer, and preaching. Mm, I pray something has been said to encourage your heart on today. I hope that you'll take a nugget from today's sermon and share it with someone else this week. And please don't forget to give also. We need your support and we appreciate your financial contributions. And remember, you can text, you can mail it to our 8800 location, or you can log on to our app to give just as God has purposed in your heart. It's that simple. Amen. Listen, before we go, I want to pray for you. And then our worship team is going to close us out today. And I just hope and pray to see you here on next week. Heavenly Father, bless you and thank you, God, for these your people that have watched, have witnessed your word, have praised and worshiped with us. God, and I pray, God, that you will begin their week, God, with a week of blessings. Grace them and grant them mercy, God. And God, touch them in areas that they have the greatest needs. We give you the glory, God, in advance of what you're doing already. And we thank you, God, for your majesty, for your miracles, for your power. We love you, God. In the name of Christ Jesus, we do honor you and extol you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. But from every nation and time, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hey, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. You're so good, God. We worship you. I sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. For who you are, and you are good. Y'all sing with me now, Lord, you are. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth forever. Well, Lord, you are. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth forever. Sing it again. Lord, you are good. Yes, 
Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every, People from every nation and tongue, from generation, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. And you are good. Well, you are good all the time and all the time. Sing. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. Well, Lord, you are good in your mercy. Do it forever, Lord. You are good at your mercy and do it forever. Everybody sing, people, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. We worship you. Change 
It is certainly my hope that something was said today that spoke to you and to your story. You see, for me, African-American authors like Ralph Ellison, W.E.B. Du Bois, 
Maya Angelou, these people paved the way for a young black man such as myself. They allowed me to dream, to write, and to believe. It is because of authors such as these that I myself can stand here today as not only a writer, but a published author. Yes, the road that they paved, the battles they won, the life they lived, those things have allowed me to write three books of my own. Their stories allowed me the opportunity to watch my dreams become a reality. And how ironic that I stand here today with a job that allows me to teach and preach from the greatest book ever written, the Holy Bible. God bless you. Good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy and do it forever. From every nation and town, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hey, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. You're so good, God. We worship you. I'll sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. For who you are, and you are good. 